This podcast is brought to you by Audible. Have you been wanting to read more, but don't seem to have the time? Well, with Audible, you can read your books without having to find the extra time in your busy schedule. Stuck in traffic on your way home from work? Why not marathon the Harry Potter books? In the gym and want to learn about the First Lady? Well, you can listen to Becoming Michelle Obama while doing Leg Day. And if you go to audibletrial.com slash cultivate, you get a month free of Audible. That includes one credit that you can trade in for any audiobook of your choice, access to thousands of audiobooks free to listen to with your account, and best of all, you have access to all of your favorite podcasts in the app as well. So be sure to go to my link, audibletrial.com slash cultivate. That's C-U-L-T-I-V, the number eight, to sign up for a free month of Audible and start reading today. Thank you, Audible, for supporting the show. We are. We are. We are Cultivate. 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 We are Cultivate. Hello and welcome to Ye Old Crime, where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stangle. Hello. Hello. You are in a different location today. I am. I am up north. Up north there. Yep. At the, uh, at the Kiabin. Yeah, that Kiabin. It's not my Kiabin. I'm not that affluent. I was trying to think of the word, which is pretty good considering I've had zero caffeine so far this morning. Yeah, I was chugging my water gel, oh, the caffeinated yeah. water, and I put some like meal with caffeine and B vitamins in it. Oh, yeah. And I was just like <laughs> chugging it before this, hoping for the best. It's a good combination, in the, like especially in the summer. Mm-hmm. And I'll make little Mio ice cubes and I'll make like a slushy in the morning. So it's it's essentially nice. all water mm-hmm. and it's all caffeine. <laughs> nice. All right. This is something a little bit different. Okay. So we are going to be discussing the plague village of Am. Nice. And where's this in the world? This is in England. Ah. Because Am could be just about any country. This is true. Right? Like, Mm -hmm. it's a very, it's, I was thinking Scandinavian, but. Nope. England. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. Let's go. Information was pulled from the following sources. A 2022 British Heritage Travel article. 2021 Mental Floss article by Virginia Williams. 2020 The Guardian article by Peter Beaumont. 2020 Washington Post article by Zach Purser-Brown. 2016 BBC News article by David McKenna, Historic UK article by Victoria Mason, and Wikipedia. Nice. And links to all of these articles will be included in the show notes. Plagues and pandemics are nothing new to us here in 2022. Yep, we're very familiar. (laughs) Yep. But when it came to fighting off communicable diseases back in the 17th century, knowing how to stop the spread was anyone's guess. Yeah. I mean, it still kind of is, but yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Today, we're going to discuss how one village's actions helped stop the spread of one of the deadliest plagues in history, the bubonic plague. Dang, they conquered the bubonic plague? Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. Now, when it comes to the bubonic plague, or the Black Death, it spread through Europe in waves starting in the 14th century. It was highly transmissible and the mortality rate was high. You were lucky if you survived after contracting it. Yep. Or if you didn't contract it. The chances of you not con- not getting it when everybody else did was very, very low. Similar to today's pandemics, it was spread via popular routes, which in this part of history meant trade routes. Mm. Yeah, where a lot of people from different parts of the world came together. Yep. And mingled and coughed in each other's faces. Yep, and went from really busy, populated cities into smaller villages Mm -hmm. on their way to other bigger cities. Yep. By the 17th century, healers still had no idea what was causing the plague, 
although there were theories. The usual wrath of God, or miasma, which was another term for bad air. Uh, I mean, I feel like back back during that time, you only had miasma mm-hmm. because there was no like treatment of water in yeah. proper landfills. So it's just yeah. composting everywhere all the time. Yeah, unintentionally. <laughs> yeah. The ideas on how to prevent yourself from getting it were just as bizarre. Smoking tobacco. <laughs> Replace, replacing the bad air with different kind of air. Different kind of bad air. Yep. Na- natural air. Yep. <laughs> Cleaning up one's rubbish, which was actually a pretty good idea. Yep. Yep. And the standard repentance of sins and prayers. <laughs> I mean, it's a good effort. It's, yep. it's, it's one of those like participation trophy Things. Yeah, like a for effort. Look, you, the the thought was there. Yep. Many took to carrying around a sachet that was full of flowers, herbs, and spices that they could sniff in order to counteract the bad air's influence. That's kind of cute. It is. It's like a little bag of potpourri that you just keep. Right. With you. Like John, don't forget your potpourri. I don't want you to die from the plague. Don't forget your pocket potpourri. <laughs> To your plague protection pocket potpourri. Honestly, why didn't we start doing that with the masks? That would have been nice. Yes. Lightly scented masks. Some people have problems with scents. Ah, that's true. As a reminder, here are some quick and dirty statistics about the Black Death. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. People infected usually developed flu-like symptoms, fever, spasms, vomiting, after an incubation period of three to seven days. And the... Fatality ratio was 30 to 60%. The bubonic plague was the most common and easily diagnosed by the painful swelling of the lymph nodes or the buboes, Mm -hmm. the big swelling red places. Yeah. Kind of hard to, it'd be hard to hide. Yeah. Kind of hard to hide. Going on a first date. Is that a swollen buboes? (laughs) Are you covered in buboes? No. (laughs) As he's all sweaty and like shaking. (laughs) I only got one more night to live. <laughs> Don't ruin want, this for me, Martha. I just want to find love. <laughs> Today, we know that the plague is, was spread by fleas. And in the case of George Vickers of the village of Am, England, he would soon earn the dubious title of Patient Zero. Oh, you never want that title. No. That's, that's the one time when being first is not good. Yeah. George was a tailor's assistant in Am, which in August of 1655 had a population of around 800 people. That's a lot for a village. Mm -hmm. Numbers varied. Some places said it was 350, some said it was 700, but the bulk of my sources said 800. So I'm going to go based off that number. Mm -hmm. Okay. He placed a parcel of damp cloth that had just arrived from London near the hearth to dry having no idea that the cloth was in fact infested with plague-carrying rat fleas. Okay, how do you not see rat fleas? Are they really small? I'm assuming it was a rolled-up parcel of cloth, Mm. and they were hidden. And he didn't roll it out. He hadn't unrolled it until that moment, and that's when it was like, Hi, we came from London. Cheers. (laughs) In that case, I'd just throw it in the fire. Bye. Yeah. I don't need that cloth. I'll make my own. Yeah. As you can imagine, George soon found himself bitten. And by September 7th, 1655, he became the first casualty of the plague in AM. Within the span of a few days, his employer, Alexander Hadfield, as well as George's own stepsons would also die. As fall turned to winter, people within the tiny village continued to contract the disease and die as it swept its way through. Between September and December 1655, the plague had claimed 42 lives. Wow. By the following spring in 1656... You, you froze so suddenly, It's I was wondering if it was a glitch. <laughs> in 16... <laughs> this... Okay. I got my first numbers wrong. Hmm. It should be 1665. 
I got my first numbers wrong, so I apologize. I was like, that doesn't add up. I was like, we didn't time travel 10 years in the span of a winter, so. (laughs) It was a really tough winter. (laughs) That's not how time works. That was the roughest winter ever. The roughest 10-year winter ever. (laughs) The 10-year winter. (laughs) (laughs) Full of white walkers. Right. And zombie fleas. And zombie fleas. Mm -hmm. Can only be killed with dragon glass. (laughs) By the following spring in 1666, A.M.'s newly appointed 28-year-old reverend, William Mompesson, worked with the previous reverend, a man named Thomas Stanley, to put in motion a plan that would prevent the further spread of the disease to the surrounding villages, such as Sheffield and Bakewell. All right. See, Mompesson needed the help of Stanley because he was deeply unpopular with the villagers. Really? A reverend? Yeah. See, Mompesson had been dispatched to AM in April the previous year after Stanley was removed as reverend. Stanley had refused to follow the 1662 Act of Uniformity that was introduced by Charles II. This act made it so that the Book of Common Prayer was required in religious services. Ah, so he kind of stepped into the role of being a bad guy because he essentially was seen as the person kicking out the guy that they liked yep. and forcing them to pray a certain way that they didn't want to. Yep. He introduced too much change. Yep. How dare. So Reverend Stanley, as well as the bulk of the population of AM, had supported Oliver Cromwell and a Puritan government prior to the monarchy's restoration in 1660. Ah. Yeah, Puritans, they don't like change. Yeah. Mompesson knew that he would need Stanley's help if he wanted to persuade the villagers to sacrifice themselves in order to prevent the plague from spreading past its borders. Yeah, that's a tough, that's a tough marketing. That's a tough (laughs) sell. (laughs) It's a real tough sell there. Stanley was living on the edge of the village, essentially in exile, and it was after the pair met that they were able to come up with the plan. On June 24th, 1666, both men convinced the people of AM to set up a cordon sanitaire, or a quarantine zone, and requested that they all stay within its boundaries. Signs were posted at the border of the zone, warning outsiders to stay away. In theory, this plan sounds relatively doable. Mm-hmm. But for the people of AM, there was a problem. The town wasn't self-sufficient and relied on trade with their neighbors in order to survive. I was just wondering that if they had farmers and, you know, artisans, all that good stuff. Yep. They didn't. (laughs) They didn't. Uh Spoiler alert. AM was part of an important trade route between Sheffield and Manchester. And in order to prevent everyone in the village from starving to death, Mompesson worked out a deal with the Earl of Devonshire, who lived in nearby Chatsworth who offered to send food and supplies if the people of AM agreed to quarantine. If you stay there and don't touch us, you can have food. We will feed you. Reverend Mompesson stated that if they all agreed to stay, which meant that essentially they were willingly choosing to die, Mm -hmm. he would stay as well and do all in his power to aid them and alleviate their suffering. His wife... Catherine Mompesson later wrote in her diary, quote, It might be difficult to predict the outcome because of the resentment as to William's role in the parish, but considering that the Reverend Stanley was now stood at his side, perhaps he would gain the support necessary to carry the day, end quote. In fact, they'd even come up with a system in which they could still safely trade goods. Nice. The solution was a boundary stone that was placed at the southern border between A.M. and the nearest village of Stony Middleton, which is kind of funny. Yeah. The rock was used as a drop-off point and had six holes drilled into it. Coins that were used to pay for the supplies were dropped into holes that were filled with vinegar, which at the time was believed to kill infectious bacteria. Does vinegar kill fleas? They didn't 
at the time they didn't didn't know about the fleas, but they're, right. Okay. They're trying. They're trying. They're trying. In addition to the boundary stone, Reverend Moppison would conduct church services outside at Cucklet Delph to reduce the amount of exposure the villagers would have with one another. So they're not all going into the, you know, cramped church. Mm -hmm. To further keep the number of people congregating in one space reduced, the townspeople were unfortunately required to bury their own dead and to do so as close to where they died and as quickly as possible following their death. Yeah. You know, because open air funerals are also prime time for exposure. Right. This practice was obviously difficult for many people, but particularly Mm -hmm. for a woman named Elizabeth Hancock, whose husband and all six of her children passed away in the span of eight days. Mm. She was forced to drag their bodies from their farmhouse to the nearest field where she had to bury them alone. That's so sad. Entire families were wiped out by the illness, including the Thorpe family, all nine of which passed between September of 1665 and the summer of 1666. Damn. I read somewhere that there were people, like, I think part of the border was on a hill, and mm-hmm. there were people at the top that were, like, watching her have to, like, take all of her children and her husband out of her house, and they wanted to help her bury them, but they couldn't cross. Yeah. That's awful. August of 1666 claimed the highest number of victims, with up to five to six deaths a day. This was partially due to the fact that the weather was particularly hot, which meant the disease-carrying fleas were much more active. Mm -hmm. A man named Marshall Howe was charged with burying those whose families were entirely wiped out, with no one left to bury them. He was infected towards the beginning of the outbreak, But after he survived, he was mistakenly under the impression that he couldn't get infected again. Yeah, that's not how disease works. But good try. (laughs) Yeah. It it sometimes sometimes works like that, but mostly no. Yeah, most of the time, no. (laughs) Most of the time, definitely not. (laughs) Yeah. Marshall would help himself to the possessions of the people he was tasked with burying as a little reward. But his greed would prove to be his undoing. God said, nope. He would later have to bury his wife, Joan, and his two-year-old son, William, after both perished from the plague. It's entirely possible that they were infected by some of the pilfered items that Marshall brought home with him after burying previous plague victims. Yeah. Saw that coming. Reverend Moppison's own wife, Catherine, died after contracting the disease from the many people in the village that she had helped attend. Mm-hmm. She passed away at the age of 27 on August 25th, 1666, leaving the reverend to raise their two children alone. In one of his letters, Mompasson wrote, quote, My ears have never heard such doleful lamentations. My nose has never smelt such noisome smells. And my eyes have never beheld such ghastly spectacles. A Golgotha, a place of skulls, end quote. Mm-hmm. Of the 800 villagers that called AM home when the plague started in August of 1665, 260 perished from 76 different families, with 20-year-old farmer Abraham Morton marking the last when he died on November 1st, 1666. That's actually not a lot. No. I was expecting at least half of the village, so... That alone is incredibly impressive. It's devastating, Mm -hmm. but that's really incredible that they lost, you know, just a quarter Mm -hmm. almost. So, damn. Mm -hmm. Abraham was one of 18 Mortons listed as plague victims in the church register. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, the mortality rate in AM was double that of the Great Plague of London, just based off of... the. The pop- patient, like, population. patient population. Mm-hmm. But after 14 months of quarantine, they had beaten the disease. Mm-hmm. Following the end of the plague, Reverend Moppison encouraged the villagers to burn their clothing, bedding, and furniture, as well as fumigate their homes to get rid of any lingering effects of the bubonic plague. Which would have gotten rid of the fleas. Mm-hmm. Thanks in part to the efforts of Reverends Moppison and Stanley, as well as those of the neighboring villages, A.M. was able to halt the spread of the bubonic plague across northern England, and by doing so, 
likely saved thousands of people from almost certain death. That's incredible. Reverend Maupassen left AM three years later in 1669 to work in Eakring, Eakring, Nottingshire, Nottinghamshire. God, you guys. (laughs) Your names. But due to his reputation working in the Plague Village, he was made to live in a hut in Rufford Park until the residents of the town kind of got over their fears. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. It sucks. It sucks, but Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I would too. I'd be, I'd be hesitant. Yeah. If you visit AM today, which lies just north of Bakewell in the Peak District, many of the houses have plaques on the outer walls detailing the deaths that took place there. (laughs) Which is creepy, but also kind of cool that they preserve. No, it's definitely it's cool, but it's also just like very morbid ghosts. These are all of our ghosts. Welcome. They also celebrate Plague Sunday, which takes place on the last Sunday of each August in Cucklet Delph and has since 1866. The Victorians would. Yeah. You can also visit their Village Plague Museum and the 12th century St. Lawrence Church. Lastly, I'd like to leave you with a quote from local Victorian historian William Wood from 1842. Quote, let all who tread the green fields of Aeum remember, with feelings of awe and veneration, that beneath their feet repose the ashes of those moral heroes who, with a sublime, heroic, and unparalleled resolution, gave up their lives, yea, doomed themselves to pestilential death to save the surrounding country. Their self-sacrifice is unequaled in the annals of the world. End quote. Yeah. And that is the story of AM, the Plague Village. What an incredible story. Mm-hmm. I feel a little bad that it was kind of short, but at the same time, I'm glad it was kind of short. We've had a lot of longer episodes lately, so. We've had a lot of uh, thick boys. Yep. Yeah. If you like Weird and Strange History, then I have the podcast for you. My name is Brenda, and I'm the host of Horrifying History. Are you into the dark side of history? Horrifying History tells you about the side of history that people don't normally talk about. We talk about the tales of haunted places, infamous true crimes, cursed items, and unsolved mysteries, and then we look into the science and documentation to see where does the truth actually lie. Want to get spooky with us? Get your Horrifying History fix by subscribing to Horrifying History, which you can find on any major podcast provider. This week's podcast plug is the Horrifying History podcast. (laughs) Nice fit. Each week, host Brenda shares the unexplained, paranormal, and supernatural happenings that have stained the pages Mm. of history. Nice. Topics include children who kill, haunted hospitals, doppelgangers, and much more. I hate doppelgangers. I know. That stuff. I hate it. (laughs) Each episode is around 30 to 45 minutes long and gives you an eerie glimpse into some of history's creepiest tales. And we will have a link to the show in the show notes. Nice. And our last listener question Mm. comes from Alex from Weird Distractions. And this one is kind of posed to me, so I feel bad. But No, that's okay. I mean, last week's was geared towards you, really. (laughs) Yeah. So it's all good. We're even. But she wants to know, how excited are you for September 2022? And the reason she's asking that is because myself, Alex, Emily from Drink Drug Dead and Pineapple Pizza, and Ashley from Studying Scarlet and Pineapple Pizza, we are all going to meet up for the first time in september we're all gonna go to ashley's and we're gonna hang out for a long weekend so that's so awesome i'm very excited i've already booked my tickets nice i am flying to go visit emily and we're gonna carpool together to nice to everybody else cool so that'll be fun absolutely what's something good you'd like to share this week well we had a really hard and hectic week at work. I worked really late almost every single day this week, like eight to nine o'clock. 
gross. Yeah, it was it was really rough. And so yesterday, I finally got to do what I've been wanting to do this whole week, which was we set up a hammock on our little patio. We we live oh. on the first floor. And so I got to sit out on the patio and read a book for nice. like two hours in the morning. And then I ended up falling asleep and <laughs> my fiance came out a couple times to swing, mm-hmm. to swing me. And I fell asleep immediately when he first did that. <laughs> Hammocks are amazing. Yeah. And this one in particular cocoons you. Mm, yeah. So yeah, it was, it was really nice. And then mom and dad called because they had just met the dog that they want to adopt Mm -hmm. and they were in town. So they woke me up and we had lunch and it was great. There you go. (laughs) But it was just, it was just a really nice relaxing thing. And I've been wanting to go out to the hammock, but nervous about going out to the hammock and feeling guilty because I had so much stuff to get done for work. I feel that. Yeah. Cause every, every work has busy seasons, you know, Mm -hmm. like there are just times where you can't avoid spreading out the deadlines and so, yeah, it was a particularly long week. So I, it was nice to have a quiet, soothing morning yesterday. There you go. What about you? What's one good thing? So yesterday, my family and I, we took part in a event where people who have like electric devices, such as like electric skateboards, scooters, unicycles, bikes, and one wheels, obviously, I'll get together for a ride. So we took part. I was one of four adult ladies that were there. (laughs) So it was kind of nice to see some other ladies representing. But it was, I guess it was the largest gathering they've had so far. There was around 60 people there. Nice. And it was kind of cool. There were a couple other kids, not just mine, that took part. I almost biffed it one time. Like I almost like fell off the front. Ooh. That would have been rough. like nosedived. And that was because I was going over this gap into this tunnel, but I had been going too slow because mm. I had just gotten back on after like stretching out my ankles. Yeah. So that was kind of my fault for going too slow, but I was able to catch myself. I didn't fall. Nice. Scared the shit out of me. Like I was like, I'm, <laughs> I almost had a heart attack. I was like, this is how I go. <laughs> oh, man. But I was able to catch myself. It was really fun. It was a really nice day yesterday. And it was cool to see that I could kind of keep up with all of these other people who've been doing it a lot longer than I have. That's awesome. Made me feel like a pretty cool, almost 40-year-old lady. (laughs) All right. Let's shut her down. All right. You can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at Yield Crime Pod and on Facebook and Instagram at Yield Crime Podcast. We have a YouTube channel. Please subscribe. Check it out. Check it out. If you'd like to send us something in the mail, we do have a P.O. Box. You can mm-hmm. reach out to us at Yield Crime Podcast, P.O. Box 341, Wyoming, Minnesota 55092. You can email us at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com. Send us your questions or this segment's going to go bye-bye because we don't have any more. <laughs> if you'd like to support the show but can't do so financially, a great way is to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Good Pods, and you can leave ratings on Spotify. And this week's review actually was sent using the submission form on our website. Oh. And it comes from a woman named Debbie. I won't list her last name. And she said, just love your podcast. I've just discovered your podcast and love it. I'm a 45 British mom who just loves something a bit different to listen to when I'm working and you hit the spot. It's just refreshing with the way the world is today. And I wanted to thank you for adding some fun to my day. Nice. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Debbie. That was very sweet. Very sweet. If you'd like to support us financially, you can do so on Buy Me a Coffee. You can also join our Patreon for as low as a dollar a month to get early ad-free access to all of our content. And if you want to rep our merch, head on over to Tee Public. <laughs> and on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale. As old as crime.